it has been compared to that of a third world country. Now the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, headquartered here in Atlanta, has declared the HIV problem in the city a public health emergency. As of 2013, approximately 5.6 million people call Georgia home. The CDC estimates the likelihood of contracting HIV, if you live in Georgia, is 1 in 51. And the new cases of this incurable virus is impacting African American men, women, and even teenagers at an alarming rate. At In Contact, we wanted to know why. So, we did a little digging. According to an Emory University article, the high rates of HIV and AIDS are mostly confined to a specific group, and that group is young black men who have sex with men. The article stated AIDS is the leading cause of death for black men in Georgia between the ages of 35 and 44 who are poor, lack insurance, and are stigmatized. On today's episode of In Contact, we want to talk about this epidemic, discuss the reasons why so many black men, women, and young men are becoming HIV positive so that we can change the story from problem to problem solved. I'm so honored to welcome and introduce today our panelists from a diverse perspective and experience to provide an insight on today's discussion, HIV in our community. Our first guest is Ms. Nicole Bufong, Regional Director of the Caribbean for Minorities for Medical Marijuana. We have with us Kevin Walker, Licensed Professional Counselor. Ms. Nicole, no, excuse me, Ms. Ferretta Jones, Peer Specialist with Stomp Out Stigma and Heather Ivey. And Leroy McLaurin, Director of Operations for Red Project Red Point. Did I get that right? Project Red Paint. Red Paint, yes. All right. Thank you all for being here and for uh, sharing your experiences today. So if you could, we're going to start with you. Tell us what you do at your organization. Uh, well, um, I wear many hats, uh, but focusing mainly on the Caribbean, um, as the Regional Director for the Caribbean for Minorities for Medical Marijuana, we're a nonprofit and advocacy group. So our mission is to uh, build the education around the cannabis plant and the use of it for um, industrial purposes and for medicinal purposes and how we can be a part of that industry. Um, but I'm also working with another organization called Aura Ventures and um, we just launched our international investment fund and um, I'm also director of business development for the Caribbean and Latin America for them as well. So just getting into our communities and educating them about uh, the uses of this plant. Love it. And Mr. Kevin Walker, tell us what you do. Well, currently I'm a, the um, PSSW for the DeKalb Department of Juvenile Justice, working with children. That's what I specialize in. Um, children with uh, adolescent issues regarding depression, suicide, ideation, things of that nature. Hmm. All right, Miss Freda, tell us uh, what you do. Okay, a little bit about what I do. Um, being a peer specialist, um, I provide love and support to the community. With the Heather Ivy, I created a private Facebook network for women only that's living with HIV. And also, um, what stop out the stigma is go around in the community and educate the world, the community about HIV, so that way we can erase the stigma of HIV. Which what we need, we need yes. to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Leroy, introduce yourself, please. Um, I'm Leroy McLaurin. I am the director of operations for Project Red Paint. We are a peer-led advocacy group of young men who focus on providing support, awareness, knowledge, and encouragement to those who are affected or living with HIV um, in our community. And we are excited about our future. We're um, a year into it, and it's amazing. I love what I do. I have a great team behind me, and we're just excited to be in the community, working hard to end the stigma that we live in today. I, amen. Now, I'm going to start with you. How has the HIV epidemic, specifically in Atlanta, how has it affected you, either from your work, your family, or you personally? Uh, I can say with myself personally, uh, moving here, um, I came with no plan. Um, and I find that a lot of my brothers and sisters who come here are looking for something greater in life, are wanting to achieve more, or want something to gain back from their community and their brothers and sisters. And a lot of us move here not um, receiving care, not knowing how to seek it. And so um, at, Project Red, at Project Red Paint, we offer that, those services to get you into that care. 
Um, um, another experience I have, um, we are afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that's the big thing that we deal with. We're afraid to talk about it and get our voices out there, but we cannot be that afraid to do it. And so I'm just great to be a part of it and be excited about it. Okay, and you said we're afraid to talk about it. Let me segue this question to you, Kevin. As a counselor, especially dealing with young children who suffer from depression, if the HIV um, epidemic is affecting our youth, how have you seen that in your daily work? Well, um, with children that I deal with um, on a daily basis in the community, um, I've, I noticed that a lot of kids don't have um, the knowledge or understanding of what the actual disease is. Mm -hmm. so, um, so therefore, a lot of times they've been kind of desensitized to even knowing the dangers or the harms that might be Mm -hmm. uh, that may need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where um, I see a lot of deficits with regards to that. And here's why I, I want, I'm glad you said that. For my women on the panel, mm -hmm. I'm not a mother. I'm not sure if you two are. Yes. Talk about how our babies are affected by this. Let's Ooh. go first. Oh, yeah. um, our babies are affected. I work at a private doctor's office, and my youngest one, um, he was 16 years old. His mom put him out the house. At the age of 16, you were out there, now you're surviving. And he got infected by survivor sex. Yes. Explain that. It's survivor yeah. sex, uh, yeah. It's a good <laughs> it's a good I call it survivor yeah. sex. 16 years old, you out there, you're homeless. You need to eat. You need clothes. Mm -hmm. You need um, housing. Mm -hmm. So in order for him to survive, he was having unprotected sex. So that way he can eat. So that way he can have shoes on his feet. And that's how the young man ended up getting infected. And it's affecting our kids. How he got there is because he told his mom that he chose to be gay. So she put him out the house. No, you're not allowed to be gay in my house. So by him coming out of the closet, now yes. he's out of the house. Yes, he gets kicked out of the house at the age of 16. That's a baby. That's still a baby. Mm -hmm. I, I don't deal directly a lot with kids, especially dealing with uh, such a controversial plant, so to speak, unfortunately. I hate that it is That's controversial. So that is um, but uh, understanding the balance of trying to re-educate our communities, I think the biggest challenge that I find and face within our own community is the ignorance. It's just plain, mm. it's, it's feeding into the propaganda that's been said about this disease as well as about this plant. Um, and it, so it's funny, the work that I do as an advocate for the cannabis plant, um, it aligns with my advocacy for HIV. I've decided to go a more natural, holistic route with my treatment, and that's what led me to cannabis. It's what's led me to be plant-based. Um, and uh, it's, it's ironic uh, because I also come from a Caribbean background. Um, I'm first-generation American. So the irony is, that not that long ago, we were practicing more Western medicine, more natural medicine, more holistic medicine. And because of propaganda that was established in this country, um, based on greed and racism, uh, it now has this stigma where it affects our communities, people of color. Um, it is seen as a, it's criminal um, to be associated with this plant. Uh, and then to have the disease, it seems like it's criminal, like it's a sin, right? So they correspond in the communities that I speak to. I, I get the biggest pushback from religious communities, which is unfortunate because uh, they really and truly believe that it's demonic that it's evil, but it comes smoking. from God. <laughs> well, no, when you really break it down to them, like it comes from God, mm -hmm. right? It's not like this plant is man-made. The pharmaceuticals that you say are okay are man-made, but this plant isn't. Uh, so, yeah. so that's gonna be a whole different yeah, show. A, Let's go yeah, back to sorry. one point you made <laughs> when you say, this Talk helps you with your treatment. Oh yeah. Can you expound on that? Oh wow, uh, in so many ways. Um, I, I only take one actual pharmaceutical right now um, as treatment, that's the ART, um, to help suppress the virus. And that's because I don't have access to my own plants to grow, because uh, based on research, uh, the cannabis plant has very high antiviral um, properties and they are consumed in the raw version of the plant. So I use my food, I am plant-based, I'm close to an alkaline diet as I can be right now. I'm under Dr. Sebi's oldest daughter's treatment. 
um, to help me heal my body. Um, and so that just going along that path and, and choosing the holistic and natural path is um, comes with its own, you know, <laughs> it, its own adversity. But um, I'm standing strong in it. Yeah, that's good to hear. Now, let's go back to the stigma. Yeah. Now, you had a, a moment over there when we're talking about <laughs> survivor sex. Um, can you talk about destigmatizing? I can put myself in the shoes. Um, when I first moved here, um, like I said, I moved here with no plan. Um, here I was, a young man, HIV positive, 12 years in the game. Um, but yeah, I needed someone to support me. I needed survival. So um, you meet guys who are willing yeah. to support you for sex. And um, I needed somewhere to stay. I needed a place to lay my head. I didn't want to be outside at night. Um, here I am. I'm HIV positive. This man wants to take care of me. It's survival sex. It's just that. And we have so many young men who are out here yeah. who are doing Same that in our community. They're mm -hmm. sleeping from pillow to post, bed to bed, house to house, just to survive. And it's, yeah. it hurts because um, we have a community that's so judgmental on it, yeah. but won't open their mouth and say, well, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'll help you. Why won't you help me? But what? here I am, a young man, I'm getting judged because I have this disease, but no one has opened the door to say, well, come in, brother, let me help you. Let me give you some advice. Let me take you to the doctor to get seen. Let me get you to make sure you're on your medication. Let me make sure that you're eating. It's not about that. If it's not sex involved, it's not, it's not, it's not going to happen. Mm. Wow. It's and not happen. Uh, uh, whew, we, that's, we had to have a moment <laughs> on that. Um, how have you been able to, I guess, emotionally deal with your diagnosis and I guess your diagnosis if you don't mind sharing that part. Um, I can honestly say um, God like I am if, if there's no other person if it wasn't for God I don't think I'll be sitting right here having this conversation with you right yeah. now. Um, and another thing that it deals with it's really up to me how I control it. I have control over it like I, no one else can make me take my medicine each, each morning. No one can make me go to my doctor's appointments. It really has to start with me. But having someone to support you and push you in that direction yeah. is always needed. Um, and so just by trusting that, I have to trust in myself first, and then trusting in God to know that he's gonna see me through whatever situation I'm going in, yeah. I'm gonna be okay. But to always have somebody by the side with you say, okay, Leroy, go ahead, don't, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. okay to do that. But mm -hmm. don't knock me down when I'm already down on the mm -hmm. floor. Just give mm -hmm. me that, give me a pinky finger and help mm -hmm. me get up just a little bit. Just a little That's bit of assistance. Need. Now Kevin, from a counselor's perspective, how are you able to help children or whomever cope with having found out that they've been infected? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, people are so different. Sometimes it's like comparing apples and oranges. One person can be positive and, and like, listen, I'm gonna beat this. Mm -hmm. This is not gonna defeat me. <laughs> I'm good, I'm gonna handle this. Mm -hmm. And then some people completely fall apart. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have to treat uh, each scenario on a play-by-play -play basis. Mm -hmm. Every person mm -hmm. is completely different. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, um, some of the things, or some of the interventions that are, are used for me is the first thing that I usually do is more solution focused. Like, mm -hmm. let's, let's find out what this is that you have. Mm -hmm. What type of information do you need to to have more resources in the community so you can uh, so you can uh, be able to deal with this situation? So, uh, how can we empower you enough to be able to understand what's going on? Because one of the biggest things about being a counselor is providing insight. Yeah. So when I provide insight to that person and I'm giving them the the a general information or knowledge that they can use to to empower themselves, usually a lot of that a lot of that anxiety, a lot of that depression, a lot of that un uncertainty can kind of like, can take a back seat mm -hmm. and they can move forward. Yeah. Um, Ms. Freder, can you, can you come in on this and try to wrap it up before we go yes. to break? Um, how I have been able to survive is by giving my love and support to the community. When I found out, um, I was a popular hairstylist in Atlanta and I said, God, if I put my status out here, they're gonna judge me. I need you to protect me. And I can promise you in these past 16 years, I have not had anyone to directly come to me because I asked God to protect me mm -hmm. because I know it was gonna, I knew it was gonna come to me. Mm -hmm. You know, being a popular hairstylist, uh, very known 
in the community. Mm -hmm. So I knew it was going to come at me. Mm -hmm. So I decided I want to be out there, put my face out there. I know I wasn't the only professional hairstylist that was living with HIV. Mm -hmm. So putting my status out there and giving the love and the support to the community, it, it helped me to survive these past 16 years. Mm -hmm. Six so 16 years. 16 years. You. Mm -hmm. I'll be two years in March. Two years. And let me tell you, if I had not gotten the diagnosis, I would have been dead. I was, my kidneys were functioning at 2.9 when I got diagnosed. Kidney failure is three. Um, my um, viral load was 400,000. Um, mm -hmm. And my, my, um, uh, my um, uh, immune system was functioning at a couple of points above AIDS. Um, and so that's where I was. I was literally knocking on death's door when I got diagnosed. And if my diagnosis had not been so serious, I don't think I would have looked for a natural solution. And so just having this platform and the opportunity, this, that's what God, sharing my story, being yeah. able to connect with others, that's what has saved me, all of those things. And the support team, I mean, I have a great supportive family. I, my dad was a doctor, so coming from that background, mm -hmm. already understanding, I knew who Dr. Sebi was before I got mm -hmm. diagnosed. Wow. So that was half the... <coughs> well, when we come back, we're gonna talk more about that love aspect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll be right back. Georgia Power is always working to make the connection with our customers even stronger. With innovative solutions to make your life easier, thousands of places to pay your bill, find rate plans that fit your lifestyle, get questions answered in person or on social media, even purchase energy efficient products online. Now more than ever, there are so many new ways to connect to Georgia Power. Learn more at georgiapower.com. 